But my definition of success back when I was running the video game business, back before I was unwell, was actually proving those people wrong. What it was like growing up? Uh, obviously, sometimes being the only black kid in the room did present some challenges. When you're a kid, you don't really see it the same way. You, you sort of talk about things that men don't normally talk about. I mean, like, you talk about autism. Yeah, so I suppose it's interesting because it follows on from, you know, learning to walk again. So it made me ask, like, who am I? And then after getting back on my feet, I made a decision. In addition to mental health, you also have to deal with this autism. Yeah. What was it like? Yeah, so I mean, I didn't get diagnosed until I was 35. Wow. And it's pretty common in the community simply because we're not likely to get diagnosed if we're not being helped. Right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Against All Odds. My name is Daniel Coker, your accidental podcaster. <laughs> And our guest this week, all the way from the north, from Manchester, is Mr. Lee Chambers. Lee is also known as the Black Autistic Guy. And, you know, he has such a fantastic story. I'm not going to give anything away. Uh, but Lee, welcome to Against All Odds. Pleasure to be with you, Dan. And I see you've got the, the, the memo on the, the pink shirt. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to pop against this background. <laughs> Lee, so how does somebody um, come from up north, you know, and I'll let you tell your story, but then you had this crippling disability and you couldn't walk in the space of a few days, you know, but then you've re-pivoted and uh, now you're running uh, two, two companies and you have been for the past 16 years. What's your story? Yeah, so I think like anyone's story, it's, it's a journey and if I reflect back the adversity I've been through, probably been the biggest lessons. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, I'm 39 in a few weeks. Oh, congratulations, uh, I've <laughs> grew up on a council estate in Bolton in the north and not many black families in the area, so one of only a few. Uh, and again, my parents were teenagers when they had me, so I was a bit of a surprise. Okay. Uh, but, you know, I, I did fairly well at school. Some adults kind of backed us and, mm -hmm. yeah, thought I'd make something. Mm -hmm. uh, and was the first one in my family from to university, okay. which was great. I went off to Manchester, kind of big city, li li living, living life, but then dropped out halfway through, struggling with mental health and some challenges. Yes. Uh, and that was the start of kind of seeing, you know, life isn't always going to go the way that you expect. Mm -hmm. But actually, sometimes when things don't work out, you actually learn more from the things that don't work than the things that do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. So just tell us a bit about, you know, your, what it was like growing up, you know, in, in, in your home. You know, was it like in terms of... Um, racial diversity and stuff like that you know how, how did you deal with that and, and and you know and still come through it yeah so i suppose kind of in the north there's like a familiarity a certain kind of grittiness mm -hmm. uh, and obviously sometimes being the only black kid in the room did present some challenges when you're a kid you don't really see it the same way mm -hmm. i did face a bit of racial discrimination a bit of bullying mm -hmm. uh but my head teacher in primary school like found out and actually did something about it. Mm -hmm. She was like the first ally I had ever had in my life. Mm -hmm. When she found out what some kids were doing to me, she mm -hmm. got the parents in, she got the teachers in, and she even got the vicar from across the road <laughs> and, and actually, you know, kind of really clamped down on it. Okay. And that meant that my primary school experience after that was a lot better. Because okay. uh, my parents were teenagers when they had me and I had two younger brothers, they were mm -hmm. very driven to give me a better standard of life than they'd had. Uh, so obviously they had to kind of I was put some of their dreams on hold when all of a sudden I come along mm -hmm. before they were you know twenty and mm -hmm. thinking about the things that they could do. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously it was like a Thatcherite era here, mm -hmm. uh, so social mobility was like talked about a lot. How your kids can do better than you. They wanted me to go and get a profession and do well. So they really backed me in a lot of ways. They worked hard. There was a time when my dad was working twelve hour shifts. My mum was working three jobs. Wow. And, you know, we were making sure that they were trying to create a platform for me and my brothers to be able to excel, mm -hmm. which we all have in very different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously there's a level of gratitude there to how we were brought up, which was like with a level of discipline, mm -hmm. uh, that work ethic and having a work ethic was important mm -hmm. uh, and that both my parents were there. Mm -hmm. So obviously so many people don't have the privilege of both parents being there, even though at times reflecting back, 
they weren't there that much because they were at work <laughs> trying to provide. Yeah. Uh, but I think, you know, again, you take the lessons of the things that happened to you as a child. Uh, I was a curious child, I asked lots of questions, mm-hmm. got me into some great conversations, mm-hmm. also got me into a fair bit of trouble. Yeah. Uh, but I reflect back on my childhood and think I had a good start. I don't have a lot of childhood trauma that mm-hmm. I've had to unpack. Mm-hmm. Uh, in some ways, I'm grateful for that. Mm-hmm. But in other ways, I think that also contributes to some of my challenges at the university. Because yeah. when I face some real challenges and some tough stuff, I actually find I didn't really have the tools. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So tell us a bit about um, your diagnosis. You know, um, not not the autism, but autism, not the autism, but then the autoimmune um, illness that lets you all being unable to walk. You know. Yeah. How did that happen? Yeah. So I'll run up to that a little bit. So okay. I dropped out of university with my challenges, but I actually spent a year at home get myself back into a better place, went back and graduated. Okay. Uh, so again, kind of showing you can go off for a difficult time, but you can learn from it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I then ended up getting a grad scheme in corporate finance. Parents took me to Burns to get my first work suit. <laughs> like, I'm proud. You've got a profession, son. You know, you're a white collar boy. Now. Yeah. Um, but then a year later, because of the financial recession, I actually lost that role. Okay. I had to go back home. Okay. Uh, so it was from there that I ended up working in local government to, to you know, be able to contribute some rent. Okay. Uh, and then set up, set up my video game business, which over the next five years was suddenly, you know, to grow in a big way, mm-hmm. operating across Europe, mm-hmm. you know, managing a team, a lot of stress, okay. uh, a lot of responsibility, especially still being in my 20s. Yeah. Uh, a lot of lessons from that, you mm-hmm. know, quite a lot of challenges being a young black business owner. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I reflect back again on that period, you know, we made some mistakes. I definitely learned some lessons, but I was fueled by people telling me that I couldn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, and being able to prove people wrong sometimes is really powerful fuel. It does limit your capacity for mm-hmm. learning, developing, and getting the right people around you. Mm-hmm. But five years into that journey was, you know, when all of a sudden over the course of a weekend, my immune system failed. And what happened is effectively started attacking my body from the inside. So suddenly parts of me started to swell up. Uh, obviously scary and it felt like I was on fire inside mm. and this just happened just uh, like that and just like that absolutely literally the best way to describe it is I've just turned 29 I've done my like uh, what I'm going to do before I'm 30 list mm-hmm. on the weekend by the next weekend I was admitted into hospital and the consultant said mm, this don't look good to my wife at the time mm. uh, so it was like it just went incredibly quickly then I spent a month in hospital uh, being tested for things, trying to control the swelling, trying to calm my immune system down. And it was really tough, Daniel, because like, at the time, my son was 18 months old, mm. weren't speaking, but was like looking at me and visiting at the hospital, like, what's happened? Why can't you play? Mm. And my daughter was a few months due from being born. Mm-hmm. So obviously, you know, it's a time when I was going to be stepping out of work and being more there for my family. Mm. And all of a sudden, I couldn't look after myself. Mm. I had nurses taking me to the toilet. Wow. I had people helping me eat. So it was like, it was an incredibly difficult time. Mm. But again, like in the most difficult times in life is when you're made to stop and reflect and actually be grateful for what you have had. Mm-hmm. And I literally lay in the hospital bed probably three weeks in and something just dropped into my mind. And I was like, you know what, Lee? You've had free education. You're getting free healthcare now. Like, you've never been hungry or homeless. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got two, you know, you've got a beautiful child, you've got another one on the way. You know, you've got a business, you've had freedom to set that up. That's, you know, giving you the finances to not worry about being on sick pay and not being able to pay your bills. Mm -hmm. Like, Lee, you've got so much to be grateful for. Mm -hmm. So just do what you can to get back on your feet. Like, take the opportunity to stop and think about what you do want to do in the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, and put everything into getting back on your feet and you know I was driven to do that and if anything it really helped having my daughter being born Mm -hmm. when I was in walking rehab Mm -hmm. because then I had a target Mm -hmm. I'm going to get back on my feet before my daughter starts walking Mm -hmm. so I can take her for steps with her Mm -hmm. you know what I made it Mm -hmm. a month before she was walking I was back up on my feet walked a mile without aid so I was ready to take her for steps with her oh wow (laughs) and you know what that's the I've, you know, received a whole range of, like, commendations and things since then. That, nine years ago, still the proudest moment, probably will always be the proudest moment of my life. 
What's really funny is she's now nine. I haven't beat her much else since. <laughs> and I spend most weekends on the touchlines watching her play football. So yeah, yeah. yeah, she runs rings around me. <laughs> so I know you talk about um, um, neurodivergence mm-hmm. a lot. Because you've been featured on Vogue, you've featured on BBC, um, so many, so many publications on so many platforms. Mm-hmm. How did you sort of re-pivot yourself, you know, after your video game experience to then kind of create a space? Because you you sort of talk about things that men don't normally talk about. I mean, like you talk about autism, you know, and stuff like that because you're diagnosed as autistic. (laughs) But these are conversations that people don't talk about, you know, especially people of colour. Yeah. there's, There's a maleness about not, talking about things, but you've re- pretty much um, made it your life's mission to bring those conversations to the fore. And now you're going around um, speaking in businesses and changing workplaces, you know, and doing some pretty amazing stuff. You know, just tell us a bit about that and, and how, how, how that all happened. Yeah, so I suppose it's interesting because it follows on from, you know, learning to walk again, because what that did is it really challenged my masculinity. All these things were told as black men that we need to be, you know, like we need to be physical, we need to be strong, we need to always be there, we need to be independent, we need to have autonomy, you know, we need to have mobility and we need to take up space. And actually, so all of a sudden, I had all that taken away. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't wheel myself. I couldn't even wheel myself to to go and shower myself. You know, I had other people doing stuff for me. So all those things that you were told. So I think back to like who who were my role models when I was growing up. So many of our role models, if you were black and brought up in the UK, were in sports, were in music, were in film. And they're all physical people who were all built. <laughs> <laughs> and the truth is, you know, that kind of ends up being what you see as representation and you think that's what we need to be like. And all of a sudden didn't have most of that. So it made me ask, like, who am I? And then after getting back on my feet, I made a decision which was seen as pretty crazy. I actually decided to step out of my business operationally and take a strategic role, which gave me the space to become a stay-at-home dad to my kids. Oh, and that okay. flipped the switch. Because all of a sudden, I was, I was on the other side. You know, a fellow tech founder said, that's such a loser thing to do. <laughs> and someone else referred to it as career suicide, <laughs> like deciding to take your kids and prioritise them all over your business. But business continued to do well. And I got a lot of time with my little ones before they went to school. Mm-hmm. But it was during that time, because that's the first time I went and, you know, actually went into therapy. And again, yeah. it's not something we talk about very often in the community. But I had those mental health issues at university in 2005, right? And I'd not gone and got the help that I needed. I tried to sort myself out. And yeah, you know, I studied business and psychology. So I have some tools. I know quite a bit about, you know, kind of humanity. And that also presented a problem because I thought, you know what, I studied this stuff. I should go fix myself. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I tried that. And it wasn't until 11 years later in 2016 that I actually realised I'd gone through quite a bit of trauma in different ways, especially learning to walk again. I didn't, uh, I was fixing my body. Didn't really ever try and sort my mind out. And when I went, I realised I couldn't be a good father if I didn't go and sort my head out. So I went and saw it in my head out, and that started it because I was like, you know what? How many other black men are talking about, you know, I had some mental challenges. I'm going to go into therapy because the truth is, you know, black men are four times more likely to be sectioned mm-hmm. under the Mental Health Act because the way that we're judged instead of being supported. You know, so often we're actually seen as criminals rather than needing help. Mm-hmm. We're seen as a threat, mm-hmm. and that's a problem. Because society judges us in negative ways. It's exactly the same with neurodiversity. We're more likely when we're younger, as you know, a young black boys, more likely to be labelled as trouble, as not parented well, as you know, as being disruptive, and not actually they might be struggling to learn due to the educational system being rigid and not actually catering for people who have, you know, divergent minds, right? So for me, I was very passionate about that and went out there thinking, you know what? If I speak about it, some young black boy is going to look and think, that guy, he can speak about it. 
then at least I know a bit more and I feel that I can. So it was during that time that I started to think, you know what, I need to go out there. You know, I've had my time running a business that was very commercial. Mm-hmm. How can I go and make an impact? Because mm-hmm. I've, I've faced some pretty tough challenges. But actually, I want to go out there and make a difference for the next generation. So that's where it started. Both my kids, you know, started school. And all of a sudden, I was like, Lee, you ain't got no excuses. Mm-hmm. Go and build something that makes a difference. Mm-hmm. Don't think about building a legacy mm-hmm. when you're 55 and you're sick of working. Mm-hmm. Go and build a legacy every day. Build something that actually creates a legacy. Mm-hmm. You know, sets an example. And talks about things that we don't talk about often. Mm-hmm. And you've got to be brave enough to open up, mm-hmm. vulnerable enough to actually go there. And then, you know, you can sometimes be the one who starts that conversation. And you never know where that conversation might lead if you start it. Lee, so at some stage thereafter, um, because you kind of mentioned it briefly earlier in the conversation, uh, when you said one year it was going to be a young black kid, you know, you might be that it might be said that you were um, not parented properly, you're disruptive, and all that, but. In your journey, you you then did some tests which you know, came back and proved that you had some autistic challenges as well. You know, in addition to the mental health, you know, in addition to the autoimmune, whatever it is, uh, illnesses, you also had to deal with this um, autism. Yeah. What was it like? Yeah. I mean, and, and how did you process all, all of that? Yeah, so I mean, I didn't get diagnosed until I was 35. And it's pretty common in the community simply because we're not likely to get diagnosed if we're not being helped into that process. Also, the waiting list is massive. And, like, I'll be honest, and probably similar for yourself out in your childhood in in Ghana, and even, you know, coming here, like, people didn't talk about these things even, like, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't hear about autism until I got to university. And even then, I thought it was, like, having a really good memory Mm -hmm. or, like, struggling. (laughs) It's like there wasn't any guidance around what it was actually like. So you never really knew. I just knew I was different. I thought differently, you know, about things. I I was the one who'd be coming up with crazy ass ideas. Uh, I struggled communicating. I struggled with like small talk, really found that difficult. And I had some sensory challenges with like food and, you know, light and sound as well. And so I always knew I had some, I I, I did realize when I was younger that old people didn't have these things. But I just thought it was me. Mm-hmm. But I did kind of feel different at times. Mm-hmm. And obviously for me, like people only started talking about these things in the past five years enough so that overall people got an idea of what it is. In the community, we don't want to talk about it because fundamentally it just seems another barrier or another challenge we've got to get over. Um, especially when, you know, we're a minority. And I'm sure if you reflect on your time when you're growing up as a majority. It's a very different atmosphere mm-hmm. when you're when if if anything you're the majority because we are the global majority mm-hmm. just in this country still a minority mm-hmm. um, but for me it actually started with my own son mm-hmm. so my son you know again started when he was like two like the kid could read the London Underground but he couldn't like put his clothes in the right way wow so it was like incredibly intelligent. Uh, love routine love so we were like you know me and me and my wife were like there's 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 something here we took him to the doctors they kind of laughed at us and it took four years to get him a diagnosis but on his diagnosis journey we were with the educational psychologist who was doing like assessments with him and they also do some parental interviews and at the end of that the ed- 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 educational psychologist pulled me aside and said, Lee, Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Like he could see in, in their own parental interviews that I was probably autistic as well. Um... And that's what started my journey because I was like, well, my son, I don't want him to be on his own. And also, I've been probably searching for answers for a long time, mm. but to just have and go through that process. You know what? Getting that label, it's both liberating, right? It's also frightening. Mm. You have to think, like, this has impacted me my whole life, but I didn't really know what it was or realise it. But I'll give myself some forgiveness for things that had happened. 
I've got to be able to actually think about how it has impacted me and I've got to be able to actually take that and take it out into the world because for some people who don't want to talk about it it's easier for me not being employed if you're employed it's harder to talk about because your own company can judge you and you know people some people to this day know that they are but they don't talk about it and you know what you don't have to talk about it but like if we're going to get other people to start to feel that actually it's okay then somebody needs to be talking about it and mm. especially in our community because mm. there's a lot of mistrust in the in the systems mm. and that's just mm. there's a reason why we have mistrust in the systems mm. uh but we also need to think about how we look after each other mm. uh, and make sure that you know for the next generation like i say that they can be they can be proud of who they are not feeling like it's just another barrier mm. to climb over because mm. you know there's always going to be some structural inequality that exists that will will hold us back mm-hmm. from you know doing what we can but mm-hmm. we also have the power to find out who we are and bring that to the world in the best way we can mm-hmm. yeah i was reading some before the interview um some that you put out in the public domain and you said you'd been in meetings and people had asked um when is Lee Chambers coming? <laughs> Tell us about that experience. <laughs> oh, yeah. So the thing with being called Lee Chambers, or at least having that as my public name out there, it's a very what? It's a very Anglic, 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 Anglified or whatever you call it, like Westernized name. <laughs> People are not expecting, and this was like I think twenty eleven. So before social media. I wasn't even on social media until like 2019. I thought, I'm not wasting my time on that stuff. Yeah. I've got a business to run. So like, I had no digital footprint. So people won't look you up on pictures and stuff before. <laughs> so I arrive at this meeting. I've got my kind of head of head of operations with me, who's FEMA. And, you know, we turn up and, you know, three of them come in and, you know, you exchange pleasantries uh, and like, When's Lee Chambers coming? <laughs> and I look at them and I'm like, I am Lee Chambers. <laughs> but the truth is, like, there's very few black people in tech, Okay. you know, 10, 15 years ago. And they, they were never in senior positions mm-hmm. or never running their own thing. So it's just like, you know, it's perception. Just, just perception. But it's just those little things that happen. Mm-hmm. And nowadays, people would probably go and look on LinkedIn or yeah. go and look somewhere to find out who they're dealing with. Yeah. Or maybe you've had a Zoom call beforehand. Okay. Uh, so they know what you look like. But the truth is, it only ever spoken to me on the phone. Mm-hmm. So I have this broad Northern accent. So pro- that probably creates even more perception that I'm probably not, you know, if, if, I, if I sounded like I was, you know, Black London lad, maybe they'd have thought I was, but having this broad northern accent and just seeing my name, you know, all they saw, all they heard was me on the phone and my email signature. Mm-hmm. So that's what they knew. But they're expecting probably some balding white guy. <laughs> and that, that wasn't me when I turned up as like some twenty eight year old twenty eight year old black lad with some glasses on. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is crazy. <laughs> anyway, the then um I heard this shooting that we're having a bit of a chat and and one of the things I know you are involved with as well is male allyship, mm-hmm. you know. So can you just tell our viewers, you know, what what it's all about, you know, this concept of allyship and where it fits into the leadership model, you know, going forward because the lead, leadership is something that's very... Um, um, not stagnant, it's in a very sort of dynamic, yeah. you know, and what you're doing is really um, quite pivotal, you know, to how leadership should be going forward. You know, I, I was, I was blown away. When, mm. So do you mind just sharing with our, with our... Yeah, so I mean, the concept of allyship, the word comes from the old French word alligator, which means to combine, to unite and to partner. So the idea of allyship is how do we come together and build diverse teams that are high performing, effective, mm-hmm. that bring different innovative ideas together. Uh, and if we kind of look at leadership as a concept, uh, we have a certain picture of, a, of what a leader is. And that's starting to change. It used to be someone who was very dominant, very kind of autocratic, 
very much would stomp around and tell people what to do. And the truth is, people don't really want to be led by that anymore, especially the next generation. Mm. They, they ain't tolerating that. Mm. So it's like, now my kind of version of allyship is the new leadership. Basically, how do you bring different people together who have different lived experiences to improve products and services because everyone you know, can contribute and be listened to and feel like they're part of something? And that kind of leadership requires, you know, fostering listening skills, being able to actually listen to people and understand diverse perspectives, find out about people's different lived experiences and find more effective ways to collaborate. And obviously, if we kind of think about leadership as a concept, it's very militaristic, right? All the words that we use in our business language, firm, company, strategy, battlefield, front lines, ammunition mm -hmm. all these words have been taken from war in fact people even talk about oh have you had some have you got some war stories mm -hmm. from you know difficult days at work mm -hmm. so we talk about work in a very militaristic way and that's kind of means that leadership is seen as being you know like the the battle commander from the front mm -hmm. the brave one who runs in first mm -hmm. but actually leadership nowadays is how do you get people together how do you get people to combine and to, to actually not just follow, but be active, mm -hmm. take autonomy and actually do things and use their initiative? So for me, allyship is a skill set of how do we work effectively with people who are different than us? Mm -hmm. Because diversity is not going away. Inclusion is really important. And actually, inclusive teams perform better when they're given the ability for people to feel like they're actually included and are actually able to bring something to the conversation. Mm -hmm. So for me, male allyship is quite important because generally speaking, a lot of men that I come across have never really considered that form of leadership because they've not been brought up with that form of leadership. Mm -hmm. In fact, that form of leadership is seen as a little bit more female, traditional. How do you you know work on the people side of things? How do you bring and engage people in conversations and Every, you know, I suppose historically that's looked at as something that women are better at than men, mm. which the truth is that's not necessarily the case because everyone's unique and different mm. and men can foster these skills to actually be more effective leaders because the world's increasingly dynamic, right? It's uncertain, it's, un it's volatile. People need to feel like they've got some structure around them so they can do what they do, mm. but also the world's increasingly technologically advanced mm. and with that increase in technology, it's what used to be called the soft skills, right? Mm -hmm. Those skills of communication, those skills around listening, those skills around networking and collaborating. Those are the skills that are becoming more important because mm. AI can't do those for you. Mm. But it's those skills that are actually really powerful in allyship mm. and the ability to actually foster those skills in a changing world, mean that you'll be part of the change instead of resisting the change. Mm. And you know, you'll end up being the, the leader you can be in the future. Mm. Also about being the leader that you are, not the leader that you've told to be, mm. we've seen other people be in the past. Mm. Would you say that your uh, foray into public speaking was accidental? Because I know you did a lot of public speaking as well, not just running two different companies. Um, but then you actually, as a thought leader, you know, in the space of allyship and engagement and changing workplace practices and cultural, cultural impact, you know, has kind of led you into that space, you know, I mean, how did that come about? Yeah, so I mean, I've got an interesting story about that. So I think first, it's probably quite, quite a good time to point out that I'm currently writing a book which will be out on the 3rd of January next year. Okay. And there's, this story is woven into the book. But for me, when I was younger, apparently I had quite a talent for storytelling and for narration and things. I remember my A-level history teacher saying, you know, like, that speech was almost like presidential. Mm -hmm. When talking about, from my A-level, I did uh, the American Civil Rights Movement. Mm -hmm. So I was passionate about it and that probably came out. But I actually didn't, publicly speak for about 15 years mm -hmm. after I ended up choking during a university presentation. Mm -hmm. So when I was at university, I was presenting like a, a business case to like 300 students. I just lost track halfway through and just went blank. Okay. And then another <laughs> member of the team came and like salvaged the presentation. <laughs> now, 
that meant that I didn't actually get on stage and publicly speak from 2005 when it happened. I didn't publicly speak again until 2019. Mm. So... That was the first time I actually got up in front of an audience again and spoke. So those 14 years, I minimised all audience speaking. The only speaking I ever did was team meetings and like pitches and stuff like that. Um, because what had happened is it knocked my confidence. It knocked my confidence, but also I'd been told I was good at it, and then I failed, and then I started to think, well, maybe I'm not that good. Mm. The truth is, I hadn't prepared. Mm. I hadn't prepared in the way that I should do. I just lent on my own talent, right? People said I was good. So I underprepared and didn't plan mm. and then found myself. Mm. I got found out. But then 14 years went by of me being like, no, I can't do this. I'm not that good. So when I actually got back on stage in 2019, I went back to my college where I did those A levels. I went and spoke to the year 11 or year 12 and year 13 students there about my journey. And I realised I can do this. Mm. And actually, I've got a voice mm. and a message to share. Mm. The pandemic hit, and then I wasn't on any physical stages, but I did some virtual stuff. Mm. Uh, the other side of the pandemic, can't get me off a stage. <laughs> because the thing is, I've, I've managed to, through the journey and the difficulties, also find my voice mm. and realise that I have something to contribute, something powerful. And the truth is, because I didn't speak for 14 years, got 14 years of stories, experiences, mm. adversity, challenges, lessons, learnings, insights to share, mm. which means that I've always got something to actually bring around. Mm. I do a lot of work with data and a lot of work with research, but it's really powerful to deliver with a story because mm. you can bang some figures on a screen and talk about them all day, mm. bring a story and people remember mm. like, and it kind of attaches and creates something that's memorable mm. and something that people can go away and utilise. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, is it accidental? In some ways, it kind of was because I didn't picture doing it again, so I decided to do it again. Mm -hmm. But actually, it's been quite intentional. Mm -hmm. I've gradually started to build that over the past few years. Mm -hmm. Lee, what inspires you? What gets you out of bed in the morning? Well, I think the best way to look at that is, and I spoke about this when I was on the Sideways podcast with Matthew Syed on the BBC, mm -hmm. um, but my definition of success back when I was running the video game business, back before I was unwell, was actually proving those people wrong. Because a lot of people doubted that a young black lad could build a business, mm. especially one who was you know, from the estate and he didn't have any money behind him and he didn't have a great attitude mm. and he didn't have a network. Mm. Um, oh, you're very young. <laughs> and the truth is 15 years ago, it wasn't glamorous running the business. Mm. Like, no one talked about it. Everyone was like, go and get a career. Mm -hmm. Climb that corporate ladder. Mm -hmm. Get your big salary, your nice house. You'll be happy ever after and your nice gold-plated pension. Mm -hmm. And I was there like, no, it's not worth for me. I'm not running a business. Mm -hmm. But then I was driven by proving people wrong. It wasn't mm -hmm. until I became unwell, they actually thought, that's not a measure of success. Mm -hmm. It's a negative fuel. Mm -hmm. Actually, I now get up. My measure of success He's getting up, feeling that I'm going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make a difference for other people. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make an impact for other people. Mm -hmm. And actually, I've got the variety in my life to do that. Mm -hmm. I can impact different groups with the work that I do. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, success for me now is loving what I do, mm -hmm. the difference I can make, mm -hmm. and the people I do it with. Mm -hmm. And that inspires me every day. Mm -hmm. But I'm also inspired, Daniel, by some of the young people I meet. Mm -hmm insightful, you know, innovative, adaptable, great imagination. And they're gonna do a lot more than me or you ever will. Mm -hmm. Some of these young people coming into the world today, they've got so much, mm -hmm. they're all switched on. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm inspired by some of the young people I see who kind of like, you know, some of them I've had a chance to speak to and, and mentor. But actually, I'm, I'm inspired by the hope and optimism that exists for change, mm. even in the darkest times. Mm. And actually, just having conversations and getting to meet people, I've now got a great opportunity to be in rooms that I never imagined I would be in, mm. you know, when I was a kid. Mm. Like, in the past two months, I've been in the House of Lords, I've been in the House of Commons, I've been in Buckingham Palace, I've been in the Bank of England. Mm. And tomorrow, I'm going receiving a 
crazy award that I've yeah. never imagined I'd get. <laughs> but you know what? Uh, One thing I'll say, Daniel, I take what I do very seriously, mm. but I don't take myself very seriously. Mm. Because you never forget where you came from. Mm. You never forget those shoulders that you are standing on. Because mm. a lot of people, shoulders I'm stood on, forget to where I am today. Mm. There's a lot of people who've given me a bit of advice, mm. a bit of reassurance, a bit of a push when I needed it, a bit of backing. You know, there's a lot of, basically there's a lot of people mm. who've got me to where I am. Mm. You know, people talk about self-made man and mm. it, no one ain't self-made. As much as you put effort in to get to where you are, a lot of people behind you have been championing you when you're not in the room, being your cheerleaders when things have been going right, or been that shoulder to crime when things have been going wrong. Mm. So, yeah, just forever for gratitude for the people that I have around me because, you know what, without them, when I couldn't walk, just other people helping me to do so, mm. your support network, mm. ultimately be the ones that come and truth be told, healthy, really easy wealth, right? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I'm just inspired by being able to make a change and feel grateful mm. for all the opportunities that I've had. Mm. Lee, that's, that's really, really amazing. Uh, one of the things I've, no, I've come to know about you as well, and you've just kind of touched on it, is that you're very much about bringing people along with you in your journey, you know, which is uncharacteristic of, of some people, you know, who... <laughs> Once they get to a certain level of success, it's kind of all about them and all that. But you're very intentional, you know, about um, your roots and and not losing touch with that reality. I mean, like I said, we've recently become acquainted and I kind of know the circles that you move in, but you gracefully accepted to come on this podcast, you know, and for me, that was really touching because the you could have sat on a BBC podcast, you could have sat on some other bigger stage, you know, we're, we're making progress, we're, we're growing, but then the fact that you even chose to come on this podcast and came into our studio, you know, I'm all the way from Manchester, you know, um, made this happen. You've got no idea, you know, how touching that is to me, you know. I mean, what's, what's, what's the, the thinking behind that? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, fundamentally, you know, there's a lot of people who've got big platforms. They're just a human. Everyone's just a human. At the end of the day, you know what? You've got time. You've got to have time for people. And yeah, there's a balance that we need to have boundaries to ensure. You know, I'm very intentional about having the time that I have for my kids because there's only ever going to be so much time I've got with them before the adults and they go off and they mm. take. They, they they do what they do in the world. And 70% of the time you have with your kids is like before they're 11. So I've been very intentional with that. And obviously being that stay-at-home dad gave me a lot of that time. It makes such mm. a difference. I've got an amazing bond with my kids. Mm. But fundamentally, now that allows me to go out into the world and actually, you know, do things, when you reached out, you know, a chance to speak to yourself, you've got a journey as well. Mm. You know, you have been really intentional in bringing you know, quite often black voices together to share those stories, to share how they've done things against the elves, mm -hmm. while also bringing your story too. Like, it's really important that we don't underestimate the power of getting our stories out into the world, mm -hmm. the power of being able to connect people together. And I can see that you're someone who really fosters those connections. Mm -hmm. You support people in their networking journey mm -hmm. and you create value by bringing the right people together. Mm -hmm. And fundamentally... You know, it's nice to get an invitation to come and speak with someone and build that build that bond. Mm. You know, it's, it's, people say it's hard to make friends as an adult. Mm. Well, maybe just go and speak to people <laughs> and listen to them. And that's how things gradually yeah. come. And the biggest thing for me is I've come here to speak with you. I want to build a relationship. Mm. I want to find out more about what you're doing. We've had that, you know, nice time beforehand and a bit mm. of time afterwards to do that. Mm. Put that time in intentionally. And it's not, it's, you know, so much in this world, right, is about individuality. It's mm. all about you all the time. Mm. We're a collective species. Mm. It's not all about you. That's one of the biggest challenges we face as a society, mm. that people are so, in, you know, wound up in their own world that they actually forget that we're social creatures mm. and we're all connected. Mm. And, you know, we're all family at the end of the day. Mm. Uh, but it's really important that, you know, I'm able to come here, speak to you, 
you've got a platform to share share my story it'll impact some people mm. it's like there's value in that mm. but it also it's not about like it having to be all the time about oh what are you going to give me for me coming and spending because we all become really transactional with our time it's time to be more relational mm. build those relationships mm. foster those connections mm. share your story and enjoy time with people mm. like spend so much time stuck behind screens mm. you know it's nice to come on an adventure yeah. where is people sense for adventure Go meet someone you never met. Travel across the country. Mm. Hell, travel across the world mm. and go and experience something new. Yeah. Like, we've lost that sense of playfulness that we had when we were kids. Yeah. But I'm just a big kid, so I'm always willing to play. Yeah. <laughs> so tomorrow you're getting the Freedom of London award of them. Yeah, Freedom of the City of London. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> what, what, what was the, um, what's that for? What, like, recognition of your... Yeah, so it's recognition for services for equality in business. Okay. So recognising like a 16 year journey, uh, being able to kind of give back to the city. But it's just, yeah, it's a real moment on the journey because I wasn't expecting it. And obviously, especially for being Northern, uh, it's, it's, it's quite the honour really. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it'll again be something that connects me to other people who are doing great things. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, it's, I mean, the truth is, I don't do what I do for the nice trophies and the scrolls and all the fancy stuff but it's like a little kick up the backside saying keep doing what you're doing lee mm. someone's decided to recognize you mm. but I actually do what i do because i can see the difference it makes that's yeah, what gets me up yeah but it's i suppose our work is tiring we're pushing against systems we're changing hearts and minds mm. so yeah, it's not a bad thing to get a little bit of recognition every now and again just to remind you why you're doing what you're doing. And other people are noticing it yeah. sometimes from places where you didn't even realise yeah. that. Yeah, that's one of the things I've learned with this podcast about the fact that you never know who's watching, you know, and as you're just doing your thing and, you know, you just kind of focus on making an impact, you know, somebody's going to be watching and you tend to get rewarded indirectly. Yeah. So as we bring this um, conversation to a close, we have a tradition on this podcast where we give our guests the opportunity to dedicate the episodes they feature on to anyone or any group of people of their choice. So who would you like to dedicate this episode to? And you can look at the camera for that. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> mm. I should have warned you about that. <laughs> you should have probably told me. So I had a bit of a chance to think. Uh, but no, I mean, I dedicate this episode to everyone who in this current time is facing challenges because in a world that's full of people talking about successes, full of people talking about you know how they've won, won this and won that, even on a day where I'll go and pick up you know an, an award tomorrow and feel grateful for it, a lot of people going through challenges. The world is in a difficult place. There's a lot of people whose families are in, you know, in places that are where they're under siege. You know, there's a lot of people really suffering at the minute. So this episode is for all those people who, again, even against the odds to this day, are still managing to find a place to express themselves, a place to thrive, and have used their adversities, no matter how deep they were, to actually fuel future success, not just for themselves, but for other people. So yeah, this episode is for those who are currently suffering uh, and that suffering will one day become the fuel to do great things. Great. Lee, thank you so much for making the time to kind of talk to us. And if you've enjoyed this episode, I'd like you to uh, like, comment, share and subscribe, you know, because the bigger the platform gets, the, the easier it will be to get keep getting more and more and more interesting stories, you know, because it's the stories that help you to see that you can rise up against the odds. And once you see somebody who looks like you, whose story resonates with you, you know that it's possible. You know, so Lee, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Danny.